Okay, lecture module eight, the internet and World Wide Web. And first we need to recognize the two are distinct. They are not the same and we'll define that shortly. But a bit of history. Again, we covered or introduced networking last week. And as I stated, it's impossible to cover networking without talking about the internet. And it's impossible to talk about the net internet without speaking and referencing networking. The two have just become inseparable, integrated. But let's recall where we come from, at least here in the States. Um, American Revolution, what I'm talking about now is the relevance of information. And you'll see how this applies. We, we tend to forget one of the driving factors of the American Revolution and the success in the American Revolution was the, our communications network. Um, the Postmaster General at the time, Benjamin Franklin, had created essentially an early version of the Pony Express, where information would be shared among the colonies very quickly, days. Whereas information going back to England would take over a month, and then of course some, over a month on the return trip. So that provided far more flexibility, far more agility it, during the revolution. And we've seen now, of course, the introduction explosion of the internet and World Wide Web. And this too has had dramatic effects. I referenced the Egyptian revolution. It was right, right around 2010, 2011, 2012. I kind of forget which. Um, but the Egyptian government shut down communications within the country, but the population still had access to Facebook and they communicated through Facebook. So this, this was revolutionary in itself. Also, recall what I've said in the past. We know information technology, right? IT. But we've seen a dramatic shift. The focus has always been on technology, you know, the latest, greatest technology. Woohoo. But the shift now, at least organizationally, is now on information, largely due to machine learning, the deep learning algorithm, and the relationships, correlations that can be discovered through this algorithm. Information is now more important than the technology. Our technology is fine, of course, the technology is necessary to do the machine learning, but we're at a state now to where the machine learning is critically important. And I provided an example. Um, some years ago, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, started forecasting flu outbreaks using sh social media. Now, why would they do this? Well, let's look at the, how it took place historically. People would get sick, get the flu, and go see the doctor. But maybe only one in, one in two would go see the doctor. So al already you have error in, within, in there. Then it would take some time to get a doctor's appointment, right? And we have incubation periods. So how accurate was that flu reporting? In contrast, look what you can discover from social media. You know, someone wakes up in the morning, they post on Facebook, I'm not going to work, I have a sore throat, I have a runny nose, my daughter, you know, is sick. So all these semantic representations, okay, which may indicate flu, and maybe even far more accurate and much more, in much more real time rather than the waiting time it takes to get in to see the doctor, et cetera. So again, just remember, we've seen this focus, or shift in focus from the technology to the information and where is much of this information today? Well, of course the web, but even more so what users are feeling in social media. We're gonna look at social media kind of in depth because there are quite a few things going on. The history of the internet and the World Wide Web. Again, the two are distinct. The internet is the infrastructure. Recall what it is, you know, it's the interconnections, the messages and their encodings, the protocols, all of these things presented last week. It is essentially our road system, right? I gave that analogy, our highway system. But on our highway system, there are many different things using it. You know, UPS, the Postal Service, we drive, on, on our road systems. So there are many different essentially applications using the infrastructure. In a similar fashion, there are many applications that use the internet. One of them, of course, is the World Wide Web, the hypertext transfer protocol that exists and, and is used throughout the internet. So the history of the internet, the internet was a Department of Advanced Research Projects, essentially a DOD funded initiative. And what the Department of Defense wanted was a resilient network, 
in case we're attacked. And as soon as I use that word in resiliency, how do we achieve resiliency in computing? Okay. And if you don't have the answer, what that demonstrates is you're, you're not doing enough. In computer science, we have to understand every concept. It's not like sociology or psychology that I can circle back and pick up what I missed. Everything is built on uh, an earlier, earlier knowledge. So when we look at resilient networks, we know we want a fault tolerant network. Okay, How do we achieve re re fault tolerance in computing? Redundancy. So I could be very, I could fit very fairly asked, what topology do you think the internet is based on because we need fault tolerance? What is the most fault tolerant topology? A mesh network. So again, if you did not know this answer, you are not doing enough to succeed in this discipline. Okay, so just kind of try to communicate that. The World Wide Web came along after the internet, 1989, Tim Berners-Lee proposed it. And essentially the World Wide Web links documents, links information, okay? So we actually have now have two levels of logical addressing. Okay, we understand that the physical addressing, physical addresses, we know that the logical addresses, TCP IP protocol stack is built on top of that. And then we have the World Wide Web using the internet technologies, again, which is TCP IP. Okay, so again, much of this information that I'm presenting from this point forward, um, at least for the next 20 minutes or so, is not in the text, but it's critical information. Standards. Standards are critical in networking. That's interoperability, right? If we didn't have standards, two, ne two networks would not connect to each other, at least not easily we would have to write middleware. And middleware requires continual maintenance. We'll see that in systems analysis and design. Standards are also important for the web, okay? The body that manages the standardization for the web content is the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. Standards are important because as a content developer, like when I do, uh, when I, compose and, and design and develop CISS100.com, I want it to be rendered in every browser. Well, the browsers should be W3C compliant. So if I write CISS100.com in accord with W3C standards, then they will be rendered correctly. So standards are very important in web accessibility. Um, accessibility, again, when, when computer scientists, we use accessibility, we go beyond just providing access to every person, it's to all platforms as well. Okay, one of the things that we'll look at more and more, in fact, it's coming up in Linux Lab 9, is virtualization. And virtualization is an important tool in web development, software development. I've already told you to forensics, digital forensics, cybersecurity, things of this nature, because we need to deploy on every platform. We need to test on every platform. And it's not reasonable or practical to have a room full of every computer that was ever made, okay? Much easier to do this through virtualization. So we'll take a look at that as well. So looking at the World Wide Web, we kind of can begin with the domain name system, okay? Or the domain, domain name service. The DNS is a distributed database. And what it does is it resolves URLs or domains into IP addresses. IP addresses, again, are logical addresses. I gave the example of your cell phone. Your cell phone, you have a phone number. That is a logical address because you could go buy another phone with a different SIM card or just put a new SIM card in your phone, which would be a new physical address. And we're going to map that logical address to the physical address. So I'll begin with an example, ESPN.com. I use it a lot. Um, in my browser's location bar, I'll type in you know, ESPN.com. Of course, that's a URL, it's a domain name. That will get sent to the DNS. The DNS will resolve it. What is the IP address of the domain ESPN.com? And it will send that address back to me. Now note, 
DNS uses user datagram protocol. So that's connectionless, okay? In contrast to TCP, which is connection oriented. Recall, recall what I said about connection oriented. To establish a connection it requires a three-way handshake. Well, in the case of the DNS, me typing in ESPN.com, there's no need for it to go to the DNS, back to me, back to the DNS. There's no need to set up a connection. First of all, the DNS was provided to me when the, my computer booted, and it's probably fairly local. And we probably have a fa fairly resilient connection. So it's highly probable that, that I'm going to get that back. And again, it's a very small payload to get that single IP address back. So there's no reason to set up a connection. Search. We're gonna take a look at search kind of from now throughout the rest of the semester because it's, it's changed. Um, back in 2012, there was a TED Talks, um, a faculty put out a book because they recognized that search had become personalized to where when we search for things, quite often we're, we're getting led to what Google thinks we want to see or maybe what Google wants us to see. Um, various search engines do this more or less. Um, if you want a truly unbiased search engine, we try DuckDuckGo, of course the Tor browser, Onion Rounding, um, also provides um, unbiased search results. And that's important for us as, edu for as educators, for us academics. When we're researching, we want to see all of the information. I don't want to just see the information that Google wants me to see. And it has changed, okay? I actually have evidence that it has changed dramatically. Um, how does search happen? And we'll look at this again, it's presented in the textbook. Essentially, there are web crawlers or spiders that are used by these search engines that go through the web and will index content. These are the keywords. These are the IP addresses where they're located. So that's taking place. HTTP. The basis of the World Wide Web is the hypertext transfer protocol and its secure ver version HTTPS. We need to understand that HTTP is a stateless protocol. What this means is if I type in ESPN.com and I go to ESPN, ESPN will not know who I, what, who I am or if I've been there before, unless we use some kind of session tracking in the form of cookies. So five minutes later, if I were to go back to ESPN.com, type it into my location, my, my browser's location bar, and my request hits that ESPN server, ESPN server would not remember that, okay? It does this for several reasons, one of which is efficiency. Okay, now let's look at where we are up to this point. So I'm using that example and we need to keep track of this. I type in ESPN.com in my browser's location bar. This goes off to the DNS. The DNS sends me back an IP address. From this point, now I need to set up the connection, that three-way handshake. Recall I use the, the example of astronauts in space. Hi, Betty, this is Tom, right? Recall that. We're actually going to look at the how it is handled numerically, as a computer would, with synchronize and acknowledgments. So typed in ESPN.com, DNS, IP address comes back. I now do a three-way handshake with ESPN, one, two, three. And at this point, ESPN sends me that HTML document that can be rendered in my browser. But note, that HTML document that ESPN sent me is, is essentially an, a shell, okay? They have not sent me all of the embedded videos, pictures, things of this nature, because they're not going to be predicted. You may have a cell phone that is text only. Maybe your data plan is small. You don't want ESPN sending you all this multimedia and consuming your data plan in a single shot. Maybe it's an older phone. Maybe you have a very poor internet connection, so you only want text. The point of this is it's your decision. It's our decision, the clients. The server should never thrust upon us what it thinks we want, okay? So backing up, 
I'm doing this again. I type in ESPN.com. It goes to the DNS. I get the IP address back. Three-way handshake with ESPN, one, two, three. ESPN sends net me that HTML document. I'm sitting here on a laptop with a nice broadband connection spectrum. So my browser knows, yes, please send me the audio, the video, send me everything. Another request back to ESPN to get all of the embedded audio and video. And all of this takes place how quickly? It it's really is, it's mind boggling if you really think about it. So we do need sessions though. We do at times want to remem be remembered by the server. How is this managed? Cookies. Cookies are downloaded to our machine by the server so that when we go to a server, that server will query our machine and see, do you have a cookie that I may have placed there? If so, I'm going to upload it back, take it back to the server, identify you. In my case, it was ESPN.com. What teams do you like? So I'm going to send you all this content tailored to you. But cookies also facilitate two-way communications and which is necessary for e-commerce and social media. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. Privacy and security. Um, again, a lot of people don't know what is going on. Of course, we have these digital assistants that are listening to us all the time. We have Siri listening to us all the time, interpreting what we say. Um, it was just revealed. I'll go back up here to my, cause I just bookmarked it. The US Supreme Court, Facebook tried to appeal um, the fact that they were tracking users. Facebook has been tracking people whether you're logged into Facebook or not. That's what this reveals here. And recall, in 20, October of 2020, in United States Senate hearings, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg revealed, admitted that they have an app that they use with Google and with Twitter to coordinate to share data, to censor information, and even lead people to the information they want you to see. Um, so these, these are all things that are taking place under our very eyes and largely without the knowledge or awareness of the public. And it's our responsibility. The ACM Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct makes it our responsibility to remain abreast of this and responsibly inform the, the public as, as they need to be. Okay, um, the end tier architecture. The web, today's web is built on an end tier. And what do we mean by end tier, which means layers. Minimally, it's a three tier architecture. What is this? A web site is not static. As I mentioned, ESPN does not have an HTML document sitting there waiting to, for me to retrieve when I go to ESPN.com. All of the information is located in a database, the bottom layer. That database is the lowest layer in that web three-tier architecture. Above that is programming or business logic, PHP, Perl, Java. What this programming does is it extracts information from the database and then formats it into an HTML document, which it passes up to the web server, I'll say the Apache web server, which sends to, is sent to us, okay. By the way, this is one of the final projects, one of the possible final projects is to implement this LAMP stack, the Linux, Apache, MySQL, which is, which is a database, PHP stack. So you'll have the opportunity, there are several final projects I'll talk about it probably in a week or two, um, to implement and create a website based on today's dynamic three-tier architecture. How did this come to be? Well, the history of the web, when the web first came onto the scene, organizations saw it as another broadcast media, okay? Build it and, they, and people will come. Much like TV, radio, broadcast. But what people quickly learned was, you know, the population doesn't want another broadcast medium. We don't want to just be told. We want to participate, two-way communications. And the only way this can be facilitated is with this dynamic three-tier architecture. Because not only is information extracted from the database, composed and sent to us, but now 
in Facebook. I don't use Facebook, but I'll use that as an example. I can type something which goes back to Facebook. Facebook will, you know, it hits the Apache web server, goes down to the logic. My post will be extracted and stored in that database so that one of my, when one of my friends logs into Facebook, they will get my essentially feed. It is also the basis, the necessary basis for e-commerce. If I'm going to send a credit card, where's that going to be stored in the database? We need this two-way communication. So we need this end-tier architecture, which works in conjunction with cookies for session tracking. And you've probably seen this. If you use Amazon and you log back into Amazon and suddenly you still have things in your cart because it remembered, okay? It pulled that cookie off of your machine and then populated your cart. So it shows you a real time. Now note, as we present all these things, all these facets, each one of them may be, we have to assess for security vulnerabilities. Recall with everything we do, we assess for security. So this, what we're doing here is we're bringing it all together, but we also have to acknowledge we need, every, we need knowledge of each one of these components, right? If we were to just ignore one of these components, we're setting ourselves up for security, security vulnerability. Okay, the deep web. Well, we know about the indexed web, right? Google sends its web crawlers, its spiders out, it indexes the web, great. But how does it do this when there are no static HTML documents out there, right? There aren't just web pages sitting out there. They're sitting all the contents down in a database, right? And the HTML web pages that we see are constructed on the fly. Well, the websites will have something called to say a robots.txt. And this will let the web crawlers, Google's web crawlers, web spiders, know what they should extract to index. Okay, so that is the indexed web. There is another part of the web that's not indexed. And we're gonna look at this in our advanced topics. It's been said, estimated, that the deep web is 500 times larger than what we see in the indexed web. So the deep web is 500 estimated to be 500, has 500 times more information than what people recognize as the internet, the web today, the World Wide Web today. We also have to recognize the introduction, the emergence of the Internet of Things, IoT. And this has many ramifications too. Now, what facilitated it really? It was our move from IPv4, which is 32-bit addressing, to IPv6, which is 128-bit addressing. As soon as I say the word addressing, you should be thinking in your heads, address space. With 32-bit addressing, two to the power of 32, there were really only, what about 4 billion websites that were possible. And we need far more than that, okay? 128-bit addressing facilitates a much larger address space. So now we can have these sensors, these internet-enabled sensors in the environment, which have wonderful positive possibilities. But again, they're going to have some concerns with privacy, tracking, all of these other things. And we're gonna look at the internet of things here shortly as well. So let's now, I wanna jump back into, as I mentioned last week, networking and the internet are inseparable, they're intertwined. So we're gonna take a look at the TCP IP protocol stack in a little more detail than what the text does. And, th and it's important. Um, so I am in the lecture module seven sub menu, okay? Now I won't go over, you know, how we assess a system based on quality of service, security, fault tolerance, scalability, et cetera. Now, note there are two models for networking. There's the TCP IP, which is what, what we use. It's what, what's known as a working model. And there is this other thing, the open systems interconnect. Okay, which is a theoretical model. What happened in the history of the internet is the internet was deployed, it was implemented. It was implemented before any standards actually exist. 
existed. So they were developed as we went, okay? The OSI is a theoretical model, but it really doesn't exist. It's a fantastic theoretical model, but everyone uses TCP IP because it just became the working model. It's what's in place today and it is standardized. Okay, so I won't go into that in more detail. Here is that TCP IP protocol stack, four layers, application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and the link layer. Link, link layer is the physical address. And just to introduce, we typically talk about transport layer segments, and this will become clearer in just a minute, internet layer packets, and link layer frames. Because what actually takes place, let's see if I can a better encapsulation, oh well. Um, what actually takes place is as the application data is passed down, it becomes fragmented or separated is probably a better word into separate components. Why? Well, let me give an example of say you're submitting a Linux lab. Linux lab of course has screenshots and it's a PDF. So the file size is quite large. Think about Tetris. In Tetris, if you've ever played the, the, the game, you know, there are these odd shapes and you fall down and you try to stack them neatly. How easy would it be if everything was just a square, right? Be a simple game, wouldn't it? Well, that's the goal. Recall network communications is serial, right? Lowest common denominator. If I break up all of these communications into the same size, it's like a conveyor belt. It's very, it becomes much easier to manage. So you're submitting a Linux lab, right? You have say Blackboard open in a browser. So your browser is the application and you have your Linux lab, whatever seven dot, you know, PDF and you hit submit, but that's a big file. It gets passed down to the transport layer. At the transport layer, it will get separated broken up into pieces, segments, and we'll add a header, okay? There'll also be a trailer, by the way. And note that the application layer's header is also now in this payload. The transport layer will pass it down to the IP layer to create packets. So these segments that were created at the transport layer will be broken up further into packets, IP, IP packets at the internet layer. And I can now see this. I can see the IP packet header, the transport layer header, and the application layer header. Finally, it'll get passed down to the internet, okay, the link layer, where it becomes frames. And it's probably broken up even further depending upon what type of network, okay? You'll have different maximum transmission units for, say, wireless, for Ethernet, for fiber optic. Um, but again, you want that lowest common denominator. You don't want it to have to be, you know, renegotiated down the line. So as an example, okay, here they're using an email, but I'll say your Linux labs are being submitted, okay, your browser. It's going to get passed down to the application layer, to the transport, right, segments, packets, frames, transmitted to Hudson Valley, It'll hit, of course, the web server first, the Apache web server, and it will get passed when it gets to the server itself, the Blackboard server. The frames will get reconstituted into packets, put together. The headers will, be, of course, be stripped off. The packets will be reconstituted into transport layer segments, stripping away the IP packet headers. And finally, the segments will get passed up to the application layer, at which point, Blackboard server will have your Linux lab submission PDF. Okay, let's take a look at what is in that header. So this is a TCP header, source port, destination port. Now, I haven't spoken about ports yet. Okay, again, what do we have in a computer? A physical connection, we have a physical interface, say an ethernet port, but we only have one. 
I may have a Google Chrome browser open, a Firefox browser open, Safari. I may have an email client, right? All of these are different applications using the internet, but I only have one physical port. What is the creation of multiple logical resources from a single physical resource? Multiplexing. So this is what port numbers do, okay? Port numbers will identify which application, the incoming and outgoing, where the incoming transport layer segments are coming from and what port they're going out. We also have sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. Recall, we're breaking up that application data into multiple segments, but we need to keep track of their sequence. But we're gonna see we also, we wanna be efficient. We're gonna use these sequence and acknowledgement numbers for our connection management and our windowing, okay? So our window here. Now we'll talk about this in just a minute. And there is a checksum for, you know, checking for it, verifying that the payload did arrive without errors. So now if we look at IP, oh, I'll, I'll cover the connection first. So I presented connection management or connection setup from the perspective of two astronauts out in space, Tom, Betty, and Tom, okay? But how is this done in computing? And it's important to understand this because you, we never know when this historical, what was you know, evaluated to be about as efficient as we can get, will pay dividends and I can may, maybe apply it in a different algorithm, a different process. Again, we're learning to think in terms of com computers, computing and networking. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this. On the left here, setting up the connection will be Tom. On the right will be Betty. Recall what I said. You know, Tom starts it, Tom. Hi, Betty, this is Tom. Do you read me, right? Destination address, source address. Betty responded, hi, Tom, this is Betty. I read you out loud and clear. So now Betty knows Tom is there and Betty knows that she sent a message, but she doesn't know that Tom received it until Tom responds the third time and says, hi, Betty, yes, I read you loud and clear. And in each, each case, the source and destination address were always present. Now I use Tom and Betty, but again, we have computers who have never seen each other, okay? I'm talking as if they're humans, but they're unaware of their, their, the other's existence. How is this done? Essentially, Tom, Tom's computer here, will generate a random number for its synchronized, bit, synchronized field, 4321, okay? Randomly generated, just chose a number. This went to Betty. When Betty responded, note that Tom's synchronized number became her acknowledgement. What this is, it's an expectational response, which means in this, it can be inferred, I'm communicating, I expect 4322 next, which means I must have received 4321. Recall 4321 was randomly generated. There's almost no way that Betty could come up with this, okay? This sequence number, the sequencing plus one. And note that Betty, her computer, will generate a synchronized bit, again, randomly, 5501. So when Tom responds, his acknowledgement is one more than the 5501, so Betty can infer or know that he must have received 5501 because he's asking for 5502. Now, what isn't here is the acknowledgement would be 4322. So if this were to go on just one packet at a time, this is what would be occurring. But we don't do just one packet at a time because that would be inefficient. We send windows. So during that connection management, the client and the server are going to establish what is a reasonable window size. And this depends on the bandwidth, okay? Um, how prone is, are the internet connections to errors, things of this nature. So we get into TCP windowing. So 
say that the connection was set up and the window size was established at say 500 segments. 500 segments of course would be, and I'll just for numbering, zero through 499, that's 500 of them. So say ESPN sent me 500 and I received zero through 399 and 401 through 499, which means I'm missing 400. So my transport layer would identify this and would send a request back to ESPN with an acknowledgement of 400. Again, expectational. I'm telling the ESPN server what it needs to send to me. An ESPN server is just gonna send me from 400 on, okay? Because it's more efficient that way. It'd be less efficient for my computers to, to you know, keep a log. Okay, I'm missing 400, 427, 437, 471, and sending these. It could be a lot. What if that window was 5,000? Then of course, ESPN would have to read that, do processing. It just makes sense. It's more efficient, especially because it's bandwidth. It's the interconnections to just resend 400 to 499. Now the windowing size, will be continually adjusted, okay? If there's not sufficient bandwidth or if there are a high number of errors, it'll lower that window. Why? Because it's decreasing the number of retransmissions. You can catch the errors quicker. If everything is going fine, not a single error, we just keep enlarging the window, okay? So I can get more data quicker. Okay. Um, UDP is unreliable, so it's not connection oriented. Um, it has many uses. Of course, I, I introduced that it was used for the DNS, domain name server, domain name system. Um, it's used for a lot of broadcast applications, streaming, okay? Um, it doesn't make sense if I am broadcasting streaming in real time to a thousand machines, I don't want a thousand machines setting up connection all I want is their address. I'm just going to send it to them. Okay. Okay. And that's about it for that. Give me a second here and I will start the PowerPoint portion. Okay. Here we go. With the textbook. The textbook material is very straightforward. Um, probably cover it pretty quickly. Um, a lot of information I'm not not going to cover email, things like that, um, because it's something that we all use in our daily lives. So the internet, largest, most well-known computer network, okay? It was developed at the behest of the Department of Defense, um, ARPANET, um, short for the Advanced Research Projects, and it is actually DARPA, so it's the Defense Advanced Resource uh, Re Research Projects. Again, what they wanted was a fault-tolerant network, and as soon as I say fault tolerant, what topology? A mesh network. The World Wide Web, again, is not the internet. The World Wide Web, with its HTTP and HTTPS protocol basis, use the internet. Um, proposed by Tim Berners-Lee. Many issues going on with the web um, continually, net neutrality, things of this nature. Yes, when I started using the internet, it was command line, good days. So now we just start looking at the various classifications of the internet. Okay, so we have the internet community, we have internet service providers, content providers, users. Um, we're very familiar with service providers, AT&T, Verizon, Spectrum, you know, I won't say much more than that. Content providers, hvcc.edu, CNN, you know, Fox News, uh, CISS100.com, okay? When we actually look at what supports, and I, we're not gonna use the word ownership, we're not gonna use the word control, um, but what creates or what provides the basis for the internet, it's the government, hardware, and software companies. Government does have a hand in it, but of course the internet goes around the world and governments, of course, are localized to their geographical area. Here in the United States, we know that the FCC, FCC Federal Communications Commission, um, and note the word influence 
influences communications in the United States. Um, <clears throat> there are international bodies, ICANN, that does the assignment of IP addresses and domain names. We have the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. Of course, that puts out standards for web accessibility. And again, accessibility in computing, we go even beyond accessibility that the general population uses. We not only you know, support <clears throat> all populations, but we support all platforms. And again, this is something that virtualization is adept at. Rather than having a room full of computers with all kinds of operating systems and platforms, I can do everything through virtualization on my single machine. When we look at hardware and software companies, we can distinguish between application service pro providers, okay, and infrastructure companies. Infrastructure, again, are the Time Warner, the Spectrum, the Verizon, right? They manage and own largely the infrastructure that is the work, that, that is the internet. Um, <clears throat> application service providers, software as a service, we know that. Um, a note on web services. Um, web services are based on XML, the extensible markup language. So this goes beyond just the hypertext markup language. HTML really just provides formatting instruction that in, a, in accord with cascading style sheets on how pages are rendered. And again, content providers should create their content in accord with W3C standards so that when it's, they're rendered in a browser, a W3C compliant browser, they show correctly. So XML extends HTML in that users or organizations can create their own essentially semantic representation. Now for a web service to be useful, it needs to let itself be known. I am here and this is my framework and this is the way that you connect to me. The textbook uses this example, you know, login with Amazon for a web service. Um, I don't find that particularly informative. A better example would be the weather app on your phone, okay, weather.com. <clears throat> when you log in or use that weather app, weather.com weather isn't maintaining a database, they, they are, but not a complete database of all the weather that is taking place because things, of course, with the weather change frequently. Where they're getting their information is from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. So the NOAA has a web service for these weather providers to grab that information. And then of course they pass it on in real time to say your phone's weather app. What I've just described here is a software interface. Web services are a software interface. Recall there are three types of interfaces, the user interface, right? My screen and keyboard, hardware interface, and then software interfaces. When you, when you in Linux Lab 4, when you created pipes and redirections, you actually created web, inter, uh, not web interface, but a software interface there. Okay, I am running out of time. I'm gonna stop it right here. <clears throat>